Unfound is brought to you by the generous listeners at Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube, along with our gracious advertisers. From early on in this podcast's existence, I realized that publicizing, researching, and investigating disappearances, although important, were not the total story in solving these cases. In fact, they're not even number one. What is? Education. So today, listen as I play the very first disappearance class I ever conducted at a university. I'm Ed Dunsell, and this is Unfound. I was all prepared to publish another disappearance episode this week, and in fact, Unfound starts 2023 with some of the most eager guests that we've ever had, and I can't wait for you to hear them in upcoming weeks. But really, I should have started this year with this episode, you know, in retrospect. Why? Well, in 2022... I started throwing around a lot of words and terms and definitions during the episodes that come from my blog writings, the live show, and my school presentations. The problem? Many of you only listen to this podcast and haven't partaken in all the other stuff. Not complaining necessarily, but it could leave you feeling a bit clueless. What is Ed talking about? Well, this episode will catch you all up. In addition, this episode sets up a huge project I'll be releasing at some point this year on Teachable.com, where I'll have different educational courses for the public, for families, for private investigators, and yes, even for law enforcement concerning disappearances each course geared to that specific group. What you'll be hearing is the first presentation I ever did for criminal justice majors. This occurred at Northwestern State University on October 12th, 2021. Ding, ding. School is in. Unfound news. Unfound merchandise is slowly coming back to life. I'm so thankful to have found someone who has a lot of experience in this area, but who is also a longtime unfound listener and supporter. We're starting from scratch, with proceeds going to charity. Next, I had a meeting with a new TV production company last week, and I have two more coming up with people I spoke to a few years ago. In fact, one of the meetings happens the day this episode is released. We didn't get together on anything the first time around. Maybe this time will be different. Finally, Megaphone slash Spotify has decided it wants to be in business with Unfound for another year, to at least March 1st, 2024. I couldn't be happier. He's going to go through uh, his talk, and then at the end, I can ask him some questions, so I will be um, encouraged that. So I'm going to turn it over to Ed. All right, thank you. Um, by the way, you can ask me questions at any time uh, during uh, the presentation. I have a PowerPoint presentation, got a lot of information here, but anytime. If you have any questions about anything that I state, we'll go off on that tangent. Totally uh, fine by me. Let me just uh, get this up here. All right. Um, This is my program, Unfound. It's a podcast. You can find it on iTunes, Podomatic, uh, Pandora, um, uh, 
we're Spotify, uh, anywhere you can find a podcast. That's where the program is. I've been doing this for about five years. Me personally, my personal uh, bio is I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I grew up in the Pittsburgh area, lived in Las Vegas for about 13 years, and now I've lived in the Tampa area for the last 10 years. And I have a degree in business that I got like almost 30 years ago. Uh, so I have no uh, background in criminal justice, anything like that, but I will be getting into that in just a moment. But I host this podcast. It is an interview-based podcast. I cover nothing but missing persons, unsolved missing persons cases. The most common guest on the program is a mother of a missing adult uh, son or daughter. It's the most common guest, but I have children of missing people, brothers and sisters of missing people. Sometimes I have friends of missing people. And then once in a while, if there's a, a blogger out there who has done, I think, a really good job on a particular missing, missing persons case and has been working on it for quite a long time, I'll have uh, some people like that on the program as well. But that's the name of the program, Unfound. Started, the first episode came out on the first Friday of September. 2016, so a little over five years. In that time, I've covered about 230 disappearances. There's like seven to eight billion people on the earth. Nobody has covered more missing, per missing persons cases over the last five years than I have. No other TV program, podcast, TV show, nothing. Um, I do this weekly program, about 230 disappearances, most of them in the United States, uh, a few in Canada. In fact, we just had a, a recent episode from Canada. And uh, one from the uh, African country of Angola, uh, an American citizen who went missing there. And about 300 interviews to put all of those episodes together. Now, technically, 230 disappearances. It's actually about 265 episodes because I have update episodes, uh, Q&A episodes, and some other things. So it's about 265 episodes, but 230 disappearances. Uh, and probably uh, the biggest thing for the program over the last five years is back in March of this year, the program was featured on the show 48 Hours in relation to a murder case uh, that is uh, starting here, uh, starting in Colorado today or tomorrow. And it is, it is the murder of Janelle Matthews. She was a 12-year-old in Greeley, Colorado, who went missing for 35 years. Her remains were found by accident in 2019. And uh, the person who is going to be on trial is Steve Pankey. I actually interviewed Steve about two years ago. Um, he came on the program. I did about a three-hour interview with him. Of course, he professes his innocence. But the reason I did that is because Janelle's case was actually a missing persons case for 35 years. And in fact, um, I have been called by the, prosecu uh, the prosecution to um, go out to Greeley, Colorado, and I will be testifying during the trial next week. And it's a fairly uh, sizable trial of um, 120 witnesses and five weeks. And I'm flying out there next Wednesday. I guess I'll be on the stand next Thursday or Friday. But because of that interview, uh, myself and the program um, were featured on 48 Hours, like I said, back in March of this year. What I am, I'm a reporter. I go out and get information. I'm not in the, the law legal business. I'm in the information business. I collect information and report it uh, to all of you. The way I do that is doing interviews. Uh, if, if I'm going to cover a disappearance, I uh, get somebody who knew that missing person to come on the program. I'm an independent investigator. What I mean by independent is I don't have any bosses. Nobody's telling me what to do. I am not licensed. I'm not a private investigator. I do not have a private investigator license in any state. But I just do this independently using a lot of the sources that all of you would have access to. Uh, a researcher, sometimes uh, a family has lost contact with maybe a witness, you know, if it's a disappearance from 30 years ago. How do we track down these people to see, you know, to talk to them again? How do you do that? I do that kind of work for them, all for free, by the way. Uh, all these people who appear on the program, um, I, I'm not paid or in any way by them. And really, uh, not to brag, but given the dedication that I've put toward missing persons cases over the last five years, 230 disappearances, I'd have to say this, I'm probably the most knowledgeable person uh, you will ever encounter for missing persons cases. 
um, because this is all I do. The podcast is all I do. I do not have another job. I do this uh, 24-7. What I'm not, I'm not a police officer. I've never been a police officer. I've never aspired to be a police officer. I'm not a private investigator, as I've already stated. In fact, I have to tell you my personal opinion regarding per- private investigators for missing persons cases, as they are pretty much useless 99.9% of the time. I'm sure there are some ex- exceptions. I have no background in criminal justice. Um, I didn't go to law school. Um, I don't think I could have gotten in anyway. Uh, my uh, degree is in business, uh, like I said, about 30 years ago. What's important to understand, though, is I'm not a specialist in any particular missing persons case. I'm not as uh, being that Gabby Petito's case has been in the news over the last month. I'm not an expert in her um, what we now know to be a murder or any other disappearance. Amelia Earhart, Jimmy Hoffa. I'm not an expert in any of those particular uh, disappearances. My strength is looking at the disappearance, the all disappearances as a whole, looking for patterns, what's going right, what's going wrong. What are these people who have had their lives affected by them? What do they tell me and what can I learn from that? And then how do I take that information and help other people with it? So it's just not me doing this podcast that comes out every Friday where I'm a podcaster, I read a script, and then I interview somebody for two hours behind the scenes. I do a lot of reading about disappearances and uh, try to look for trends and stats. I put stats together of all the disappearances that I cover. So that's, I think, important, uh, something important for you to understand, because I do get asked a lot about, well, Ed, what about this disappearance? And then people are a little stunned when I say, you know, I've never heard of that disappearance. There's quite a few disappearances out there, so it's, it's going to be there. Probably I haven't heard a few of them. What's today's goal? Today's goal is to give you the foundation on which you can start to understand disappearances better than anyone else on the planet. Because there are a lot of misconceptions that I'll be going through in this PowerPoint presentation. And the reason I can honestly talk about this is because it was just five years ago that I was kind of uh, clueless as well. You know, I had preconceived notions about doing the program and what what I was going to find out. And my mind has totally been changed on a lot of topics in the last five years. So it's just a very short five years. And you can um, gain a lot of knowledge if you put your mind to it. So I'm just trying to give you the foundation today. Why? Um, In my opinion, disappearances are the most forgotten mysteries. It just seems that um, if people do not keep the the word out there that these disappearances just fade into the background, I think it's because in disappearances you have no bodies, you don't have a crime scene, you don't have all the things that we're used to talking about when we talk about serial killers. When we talk about just everyday murders, you just don't have that. And because a person just seems to... Here one day, gone the next. It's much easier for them to be forgotten. Now, of course, their family doesn't forget. But it is amazing to me over the last five years and finding out how about friends, best friends, they move on. You know, and even sometimes, even when I've tried to track some of these friends down later, years later, they don't want to talk about this missing friend of theirs that, you know, vanished 20 years ago. Common. They are the most forgotten mysteries. Why the families continue to feel the pain decades after the disappearance. They have a lot of grief, a lot of trauma. For them, every day, it's like the day after the disappearance happened. I don't care if it's a year ago, 20 years ago, and I've even covered a disappearance going back to the 1940s. It's all the same. They still feel those emotions. So even though everybody else has moved on, they are still it's like fro- their emotions are frozen in time. This is one of the reasons that I tried to give the guests things to do. You know, what, in looking at it, what, maybe there are some holes in, that still need to be patched up all, after all of these years that can maybe move something forward. Many, not all, many of these disappearances are murders that I'm going to be mentioning today. I happen to believe that about 75% of the disappearances that I've covered are murders. Somebody's gotten away with something. And that missing person is actually deceased, just haven't found that person yet. And why you can make a difference. Uh, Like I said, five years ago, I um, was doing other things, uh, but just 
kind of my life just led me to this. A lot of things that I've done in my life led me to this point. And that it can be that way for you. I don't want you to think that, man, I'm going to have to do this for like 20 years before I think I'm going to you know, know anything. You can make a difference if you put your mind to it because I, I'm telling you, it's needed. So what is a disappearance? A person is expected to be at some location but is not for an extended period of time based on the circumstances. And what I mean based on the circumstances is that you were coming to this class this morning and you didn't show up. Now, maybe if you're a couple minutes late, nobody's going to really, you know, be concerned about that. But maybe a half hour, an hour Maybe you have a class after this. You don't show up for that class either. And then your roommate goes back to your dorm. You're not seen there. It, it just seems, it, you know, it's like a ball rolling down the hill. It gathers steam, steam, you know, it gathers a lot of steam to the point where, man, something could be going on here. In contrast to if you're driving across the United States, nobody would be surprised if you're driving from New York to L.A. and you're planning to get there at 3 p.m. on a Saturday, but you don't get there until midnight the next day. Who knows? You run into car problems, traffic problems. Maybe you wanted to stop and see some tourist sites. That's different. It just depends how far you're going and what the circumstances are. And in addition, nobody who knows the person seemingly, that's a key word, seemingly can say where the person is. The reason I put this word in here seemingly is because if it is a murder, It's usually the murder is committed by somebody the person does know. The missing person does know. And that person is lying. So seemingly that person doesn't know anything, but maybe that person does. And that's just something that has to be determined through questioning, looking at the circumstances. Of course, these days we can look at social media. We can look at phone pings. We can look at phone records. We can look at a lot of other things to determine if all these people who know the missing person are actually telling the truth or is there some what I would call wiggle room. So those are the basics. Things not needed to determine a disappearance has occurred. Signs of a crime. Don't have to determine what signs of signs of a crime was anything stolen. That is not required to start thinking that uh, uh, an incident is a disappearance. Signs of violence, whether it's uh, a breaking into a home, you know, door has been uh, you know busted open or a window broken, uh, things tossed around inside. That's not needed to determine that a disappearance has happened. Blood or any forensics at all. I know you have um, some CSI classes or forensics classes here. I hardly ever talk about forensics in disappearances at all. In fact, usually when it comes to disappearances, we don't talk about forensics until the remains have been found. And I only cover unsolved disappearances, so it doesn't come up often. Uh, And that is where the bones are found, and of course they're tested. So rarely do we ever talk about you know the blood splattered over a car, although we've had that discussion a few times, but it's still, it's very rare. Suicide note, this would be for... Disappearances that we believe somebody's going through something and maybe, and we're going to talk about it later, walked off. Uh, I've covered some disappearances, for example, in San Francisco. Did these young men jump off the Golden Gate Bridge or didn't they? I've covered two disappearances like that. Um, Suicide notes, not required to determine that a... Uh, that a disappearance occurred, even if we believe or the family believed that the person was suicidal. And important items left behind. Once again, it determines, uh, depends on the circumstances. You will have situations where a person goes missing and all their stuff's left behind, their ID, their phone, their clothes, everything else. And then others, the person will go missing and their car will go missing. Their phone will go missing and never and their, the, those items are uh, missing just like the person is. But it's, So there's no hard and fast rule regarding that, but they certainly are not needed to determine that a disappearance has happened. How many disappearances exist? Now, if you go to the federal database called NamUs.gov, it has in the low 20,000s uh, disappearances. And this goes way back. When I say you look at this number of 100,000, well, with NamUs, it's the same way. That what we're talking about is not um, you know 20,000 or 100,000 disappearances that happened like this year or last year. This is since... Records started to be kept whenever that was, 100 years ago, 140 years ago. But the estimate is there is about 100 unsolved disappearance cases in the United States, once again, accumulating over the course of many, many decades. 
But you should know that the NamUs database, which is the most complete government database in the world, only has 20-some thousand in it. They have a long way to go. I think they're doing fine work there. They could, probably could be funded better. It's a Department of Justice program. But they only have 20-some thousand. But the estimates uh, that people who have been doing this longer than I've been doing it, who have uh, researched this, say it could be as high as 100,000 unsolved disappearances. And we only, can, we only at this point can track about 20,000, some of them. It could almost make you want to believe in UFOs because in many of these disappearances, it really is like the person is here one second, gone the next second. And if you watch Star Trek, it, it is like the person got beamed up to a spaceship or something. I don't personally believe in that stuff, but I can see why some people might make that comment um, sarcastically when you start thinking about some of the circumstances. And, and I'm going to go through some examples here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talk to you about some of the most common types of disappearances. Of course, every disappearance is judged on its own merits. We look at the, what, who the person is, who the person was. We look at the people around that person, what was going on in that person's life. What are the facts? What does the phone's records say? What do the social media say? What did this person say to others? We look at all that stuff during the course of an interview. But there are certainly categories. And there's no denying that general categories. The first one is the man said, I'm going to get deeper into each one of these, but I have this note for that one. Relationships are the number one cause of disappearances. It's not drugs, even though we're going to talk about that. Uh, It's not greed, money, or anything like that at all. It is relationships. And what I mean by that is uh, an idea of domestic violence situations that go that one step further. Okay, to a death may not be planned, but somebody certainly died. And I will and I've I've said this on this live show that I do on Wednesday nights, that if you are a person in a relationship, you have much higher odds of going missing than a single person does. That's that's just what the facts are. Of course, there's a lot of wiggle room in there. If you're a single person who's making bad choices, breaking the law, getting in with the wrong people, then, of course, your odds go up as well. But if you are doing the right things, making the right choices as a single person, your odds of going missing are lower than a married person's or a person in a relationship who is also making good decisions. I'm going to talk about how drugs play a role. Um... Not the main role, but it certainly is a part of the disappearance. I'm going to talk about the art of luring. The walk-off, it's a murder, but, and then the final category, a lig of their own, ones that don't fit into any particular um, regular category. So let's go to the first one. The man said, and the reason I said the man said is because this is usually a situation, a heterosexual relationship, man and woman, And the woman goes missing, and the guy just says, I just don't know what happened to her. Um, Even though her car is still there, her phone is still there, her clothes are still there, her purse, her ID, money, all still there. But this guy says, I have no idea what happened to her. In fact, I'm going to show you an example of a guy who told some outrageous stories. Some of these examples are Rosemary Rapp from Ohio. Now, in that situation, it was discovered after the fact that her husband was having an affair with her sister. Marion Hurley, uh, she went missing, and uh, she had discovered not long before she went missing that her husband was cheating on her. Ellen Sloan, it was originally believed that she was evading the IRS because she had uh, some, you know, she hadn't paid her taxes. But now it's believed that the man she was with caused her disappearance. Julie Early, uh, same situation. Daniel Sleeper. In all these particular circumstances, the the man in these women's lives, most of these uh, women were married. I think most of them, not all of them, all of them. But these men just said, "Yeah, I just took off," and I, she took off. I don't know. Didn't act, they didn't take part in the investigation, were not helpful, wouldn't take a polygraph test, on and on and on. Very, just is, can, I, I could have listed 20 here at least, at least, uh, that a disappearance that I've covered like this. Best example would be Angela Green. Uh, she went missing, as you can see here, June 20th, 2019. So very recent disappearance from Prairie Village, Kansas. 
Uh, to give you a little background on Angela, she was originally from China, but her husband uh, was an American. He was over there, had met her, married her. They moved uh, to Prairie Village, Kansas. They had a daughter. And I actually interviewed the daughter for this episode. I actually interviewed a, a cousin of Angela's as well. So it was one of those episodes where I did two interviews, which is fairly rare. But what happened was that her daughter had gone on a trip for her school to Italy for like three weeks. And then when she came back, Angela in particular did not like what her da- how her daughter was uh, handling um, her life. I think that Angela thought her daughter was too caught up with her boyfriend, not taking her studies seriously. And she actually ended up kicking her daughter out of her house. A few days after that, Angela goes missing. Now, this is a marriage that, by all accounts, nothing wrong with it. No uh, history of domestic violence. Neither Angela or her husband, Jeff, had any criminal records, anything like that. But she goes missing a few days later. Suddenly, her side of the family starts, you know, we haven't heard from Angela. Where is she? They ask her husband, where is she? He says, oh, um, yeah, she lost her mind. I had to take her to a psychiatric hospital. Well, which one? I'm not going to tell you that. Is it in Kansas? I'm not going to tell you that. Is it in Oklahoma? No, I don't know. Just no proof of that at all. Then on top of that, when in the family is like, ah, it just doesn't, it's just something weird about that. Cause they, most people think it's doesn't, don't think the, these things can happen to them. Um, then he went even further to say, oh yeah, well, while she was in that psychiatric hospital, uh, she died. Uh, she had a stroke, she had a heart attack, she had an aortic aneurysm, something like that. And she died. Well, where's her, where's her death certificate? Oh, I I don't know. Well, where is she buried? Oh, I don't know. This is true. I'm not making this, (laughs) this up. You can go listen to that episode. And this is Angela's own daughter saying this, and this is Jeff's daughter as well. And she perfectly believes that her father uh, did something to her mother. Now, you should know, though, when the police actually got involved and the report was found out, he told them a totally different story. He told them, oh, yeah, one day we were here. A white truck pulled up in front of the house. Angela walked off, got in the car, took off. I don't know who it was. And this uh, disappearance is still unsolved. Jeff continues to walk around uh, a free man. But that is a perfect example of the man said disappearance, and it's way more common than you'd ever realize. And and granted, I picked this one out because Jeff's stories in this particular situation were overtly unusual. Um, But usually the statements we get from men in these types of disappearances are usually along those lines. Just – just women going off with people that the, the husband doesn't know and very vague. Oh, yeah, it was a white pickup truck. Well, what model? I don't know. Well, who was in the truck? I don't know. Very common. The man said. Why do they say unsolved? Well, just because the stories are right, outrageous and convenient does not make them untrue. The problem is once in a while, one of these um, outrageous stories ends up being true. Uh, it's, it's rare but it does happen. And in addition to that, when it comes to prosecutors, DAs, um, I had a guy on the program about four, hour, uh, four years ago. His name was Tad Tobias. He is the foremost expert on the prosecution of no body cases, meaning there's a case out there. Uh, some prosecutor's office wants to uh, file murders, uh, a murder charge against somebody, and they called Tad in to look at the evidence to see how to best go about this. Because most of the time, DA's prosecutors are very hesitant to charge anybody with murder without a body. So that's why in the situation with going back here to Angela Green's disappearance with Jeff, even though he told these outrageous stories – Without a body, they don't want to go to trial. They're not going to charge him with anything. Very, very common. Very common. So moving on, drugs play a role. People getting high, and they just can't explain where one of their friends went. Now, I'm not talking about marijuana. What I'm really talking about are heroin, crystal meth, um, cocaine, uh, drugs that are a little more dangerous uh, for overdose purposes than fentanyl than marijuana is. 
And what usually happens here is uh, a person who was an addict goes missing. Everybody knows that the addict was with other addicts and they were getting high wherever. And then this particular person goes missing and all the other addicts were there, but they just say, you know, he wasn't here. Well, he's here, then he wasn't. Uh, they could tell you everything, but you, what you really want to know. They can spin all these types of stories. Well, I was down on the corner, and I heard this person say this, and this person said that they saw this person who's missing doing this. They can tell you everything but what you really want to know. The rumors are rampant. And lack of solid alibis for these people, not necessarily because they're lying, but because their brains just aren't functioning, functioning correctly. Days run together, they don't sleep for days, they hallucinate, and they have a hard time dis- distinguishing between uh, distinguishing between reality and uh, hallucinations. But once again, drugs play a role because as I've stated many times, it's amazing, they're all doing this, but as soon as somebody overdoses and dies, they all become like super criminals, super villains. Oh, suddenly they can hide this person, suddenly their brains are thinking absolutely 100% great. <laughs> you know, but between before that point, not so much. Some of the examples uh, that we've covered on the program: Lola Catherine Fry, who disappeared from Indianapolis, Indiana, back in about 1993. She was at a party with a bunch of guys. They even admit that she overdosed or fainted or collapsed or something like that. But everything after that is they just don't want to talk about it. Clinton Nelson, that is a disappearance from right here in Louisiana. Same kind of thing. He's at a party and disappeared uh, doing drugs. Billy D. Silvestro, Ohio. Bobby Tennyson, California. Desiree Ferris, Missouri. Leah Peebles, New Mexico. All situations where these people unfortunately had addictions that they were trying to fight, but um, I think the drugs were winning. And they were with other people doing drugs, and these other people just say, we just have no idea what happened. Most uh, best example, Noah Davis went missing on July 28th, 2014, Ringgold, Georgia. As many different stories as there were people who knew him. This is a disappearance from day one. There were all sorts of rumors that he was murdered, that this cartel got to him, all of these things. But the facts, the only thing that we really knew that was known at the time was that he was with a, a, a young woman, They went to his uncle's place to get high doing drugs. And at some point, the uncle and this girl, young woman, um, said, yeah, Noah just walked off. And he said he was walking home. Well, where he lived was about a mile and a half to two miles away. And he was just walking off and he never made it there, never to be seen again. Uh, Because of really because of the person who became in charge, who from the family who was the spokesman for the family. His name is Josh. Um, Not a very good guy. He is a a criminal. He has a a long history, a long criminal history. Not a very good guy. But he, unfortunately, became responsible for speaking for the family. Now, you should know he's not a suspect in Noah's disappearance because Josh was actually in jail at the time of the disappearance. But he took it over, and he just chased, chased every ghost out there, every rumor, And uh, what I ended up doing in this particular uh, episode is I was able to find out or find out who some of these people were around Noah at the time. And fortunately, at least one of them, at least one of them, a young woman, has cleaned her act up since 2014. And she she tried to remember as best as she could at the time. And she said, you know, all those days run together, and I didn't even know what day of the week it was. And I talked to some of these other people, though, who... Uh, have are still addicts, and all of their stories conflict. It's hard to make heads or tails of anything. Well, little did I know, I covered this disappearance earlier, early this year, like in January or February. And the guest was uh, Noah's half-brother, Jason. Well, little did any of us know that a, a bone had been found between where the uncle lived and where Noah was allegedly headed. It was found in that general area right in there. And the family didn't know, but it got tested finally through DNA testing. Takes a lot longer than you'd ever know from the movies and TV. Um, That bone was determined to be Noah's. Now, what seemingly happened is that Noah was walking home and he overdosed. He died. And what happened is animals came in and took his remains in every which way direction. There were just a couple bones still lying there in the area where 
uh, he had uh, died. Now, I will tell you that Jason, his half-brother, and Josh, his other half-brother, still believe that it was foul play. I will tell you that I do not believe it was foul play. Um, I think that they have a hard time because of seven years of believing that no was murdered. It's hard to get away from that, um, that, you know, to change their mind. And they're really um, set on their position. My opinion, though, is that uh, this was unfortunately an overdose. This is very common. It's a very common type of situation. Um, but I, you should know, though, just because I differ on a theory, if I think differently than the family does regarding any sort of theory, I still help them in any way I can. All right. If, even if they are going to th- continue to think it's murder, I will give them my best advice, um, even in a situation like this. But drugs played a role. Why? Because if Noah had not been doing drugs that day, he probably would have been still alive. But you also have to look at the fact he was doing something probably had been doing every other day and nothing bad had ever happened. And then, and then this day something did. So that is a very good example of drugs playing a role. Why would people do this, uh, you know, not be helpful because they're on drugs? It's not necessarily, I think, that they are evil or anything. Sometimes they are. A lot of times they just can't remember. I just, uh, we, you know, would rather have um, s- sober witnesses are better than, than witnesses uh, who are doing drugs or, you know, other things. The art of luring. A killer entices somebody to do something he or she wouldn't normally do. Some of the common lines are, let's make up. Boyfriend and girlfriend going through a turbulent time. Hey, honey, let's make up. Let's get together. Let's work this stuff out. And how many times uh, the woman goes missing? Let's be friends. I have something for you. I'll get into that in a moment. Oh, come on. You know I know you, uh, how did I write that? Oh, come on. You know, I won't hurt you. Wrote that wrong. Um, very common lines in these types of disappearances from family members. Oh, yeah, she was trying to get back with her ex husband. Oh, yeah, she, he was trying to get back with, with his ex wife. They were trying to patch things up, and then one of them goes missing. Some of these examples Brandy Wells at the disappearance from Texas. Now, that is a little bit unique in that she went to this country bar by herself. But on the video, you can see her on the security video leaving the bar with a guy. She is certainly following him, and she did not show up to the bar with this guy. They must have met there. And so you can see her go out the door. You can see him go out the door. He goes this direction. She looks over, and it's like, oh, oh, you want to go that way, and she follows him. Her car was later found abandoned with no gas in it along a highway in Texas, and the, the guy in this white cowboy hat has never been identified. And unfortunately, you can't see his face in the video. And it's a disappearance that's about 15 years old. But I'm inclined to believe he lured her to his vehicle for some reason. Pamela Golden, um, the first class uh, seemed to uh, find this interesting. Pamela Golden was going to help a friend of hers move. And her job was to go get boxes to take over to her friend's house. The friend was going to get divorced and leave her husband. Pamela that day was with her sister. Pamela leaves. The sister thinks she was going to this liquor store to get these boxes, then show up at this woman's house. Of course, the woman and her husband claimed that Pamela never showed up. Now, remember, the reason Pamela was seemingly going to this location was because the woman was moving and divorcing her husband. This disappearance happened like 20 years ago, if not in the 1990s. The woman that she was going to see, this friend, never moved, and this couple still married. So even though they were thinking about getting moving and getting divorced on that particular day, for some reason they stayed married to this very day. So something was going on there, and the real tip-off in this disappearance was that her sister told her to, yeah, they were together, oh, you want to go get boxes, go to this liquor store, go out and make a left. What did Pamela do? She went out and made a right for some reason that we will never know. Now, her truck was eventually found, but we still do not know why she did not follow her sister's directions. But the truck was eventually found right in that same neighborhood. Stephanie Hartwell, this is a situation where she had an ex-friend, a kind of a frenemy, I guess, in 21st century terms. And um, the friend wanted to kind of make up. 
oh, let's go, let's go do a little shopping together. Stephanie, um, neighbors saw her go out to this woman's car, get in it. Stephanie went missing. The woman says she was never there. Now, the mitigating factor in this is that this frenemy's cousin, Stephanie, had dated a guy. And there is a belief that these two worked together to lure Stephanie out of her apartment to harm her because she did not want to get back together with this cousin. Then Jeff Nichols, he was into golf, Salt Lake City, about 20 years ago. He was divorced from his wife. He was trying to get custody of their son. Uh, his wife says to him, oh, yeah, come meet me here. I have some golf clubs for you, Jeff, uh, golf fanatic. I got these golf clubs. You know, I can't do anything with them. Meet me over here. I'll give these golf clubs to you. He goes to meet her before his work. She says he never showed up. And no more than a couple weeks later, Jeff Nichols' uh, ex-wife, her parents, and that son left the United States, moved to Ireland, never came back. He's never been found. His truck was later found uh, in the Salt Lake City area. Uh, but she claims he never showed up. And you should also note in that particular disappearance that his phone did ping at her house, even though she claims he was never there. But they escaped uh, prosecution, and even had they stayed in the United States, I don't know if they could have been charged with anything anyway. So the art of luring, the best example, and I'm using this as the best example, and this is um, actually an opposite case. Usually it's a man luring a woman. This would be a woman luring a man. Um, and this is a, uh, a trial that's going to happen in the state of Kentucky at some point, I gu I'm guessing, in 2022. Tyler North was divorced from his wife. He was over at his uh, sister's. Little did anybody know, they didn't know this until after the disappearance happened, he and his ex-wife were getting together kind of a friends with benefits type of situation. Nobody knew that until afterwards. Well, they had arranged that they were going to ha meet and have sex in this park late at night. He shows up there. Um, he's never seen again. His truck is later found uh, miles away, torched, burnt to the ground, crisp. And it was later determined that uh, what had happened was his ex-wife and her new boyfriend lured Tyler there to kill him. And now they are going on trial for murder. And right now, remains have been found, but it, they have not been yet identified as Tyler's. That is a just as good an example of the art of luring as you'll ever find. Tyler was going there, thought he was going to have sex with his ex-wife. Instead, he was ambushed. A common scenario. Lots, lots of luring uh, disappearances that I've covered on, covered on the program. Why do people fall for this? My opinion is because no one ever thinks it can happen to them. Because we've all been in relationships. We've all had relationship breaks, breakups. Uh, we've had classes with those ex-boyfriends and ex-girlfriends, and nothing ever goes wrong. You know, maybe there's some arguing and it rarely does it get physical or abusive, but it can. And you just never know. That's why these people fall for these things. Jeff Nichols just wanted those, even though his ex-wife had treated him horribly uh, regarding the custody battle and everything else. Suddenly, all he needed to hear was golf clubs and he, that, all that other stuff just went right out the window. Oh, she's going to give me golf clubs, totally forgetting that she hated him. That's how it happens. And these types of people are very manipulative, and they know how to push the right buttons. Next one, the walk-off. The person that is there then just decides to leave. Now, usually a lot of the times, uh, the precursor to this is depression, stress, mental health issues like bipolar disorder, in general, unusual behavior. But that's not always the situation. It could, be, it could be none of those. And the tough thing about walk-offs is that they could be murders that are just really, really, really well covered up. For example, going back to the Angela Green case that I've already described, what would we think if Jeff Green didn't tell all those crazy stories? What if he didn't say, talk about the psychiatric hospital? What if he didn't change the story when the police saw it, showed up? What if he said, you know what? Angela went for a walk and never came back. And I went out and driving around looking for her, couldn't find her. And, you know, we were having marriage problems, and I just thought she, she ran off. That would probably have been a better choice than what he did. Now, why he made those, made those statements, what he did, I don't, you know, we may never know. But so she could have walked off because people do walk off. The fact is people do walk off and commit suicide. 
Or they get in over their head. They go for a hike. They go up on some trail that they shouldn't be on. They slip. They hit their head. They die right there on the spot. And nobody finds them. These things happen. These are real. But most of the time when we talk about disappearance of this type, disappearance of this type on the program, there are a lot of precursors. These are usually a disappearance that are a long time in the making because of uh, things going on in the person's life. Some of those examples, uh, Eric Alvarado, and I'm going to use him as an example later. Um, in Texas, for some reason, got in his car, drove to Arkansas. His car was found on an Arkansas highway, gas out of it. He even took his dogs with him, and seemingly the dogs ran loose on the highway. Both of them got hit by cars and got killed, and he is also still missing to this day. I think that was the one we were talking about from Atlanta, Texas, right? We were talking about, you said you had family in Atlanta, Texas. I think that's the one that started in Atlanta, Texas. I don't know why I remember that. Chris Sanders, another disappearance from Texas. He was a, a um, natural gas worker living within a trailer with other gas workers. And um, he walked out to his truck on an evening uh, in what, the Monahans, Texas. And somebody saw him go out to his truck open it up, get something out of it, left the, the, the driver's door open, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, car alarm, the truck alarm was blaring, like, and like the horn goes off. Chris just walked off, left his truck like that, just walked away, never to be seen again. That was what a witness said. Renee Lamana, she had some um, mental issues. She ran away from her um, sister's house in... Uh, Ocean City, New Jersey. Devin, Ball, Devin Bond, you can, um, this one is eventually solved, but when his mother was on the program, he had left his um, parents' house. He think he was 16 years old, and the family gun was also missing. And at the time he covered it, um, not, did not know what happened, but since then, since 2018, his remains were found, and he had committed suicide with that gun. And then Jesse Ross, probably of all of these, probably the most well-known one. He, um, his family has done a lot of media appearances. He went to his college uh, student, went to Chicago on a class trip on the last night uh, at like 1.30 in the morning. They were at some seminar. I don't have time to get into all the details of why they were having a seminar at 1.30 in the morning. But there was a break. There is video of him walking out of this conference conference room out of the hotel, into the streets of Chicago, never to be seen again, all by himself. Now, his family believes uh, that it was foul play. Once again, I'm not so sure. But those are some good examples. Now, the best example, though, is David Schrader, September 22nd, 2012, from Bryce Prairie, Wisconsin. Perfect example of how a person seems to be just perfectly fine. Everything's going right, his life. Then all of a sudden, within 24 hours, it's like he's another person. Uh, he had children. They were also taking care of a foster son who was like 16. David, for some reason, picked the foster child up from a football game, but did not pick his biological child up from another game. He took the foster child, a 16-year-old, out to bars, and they went drinking. He was buying drinks for a 16-year-old foster kid. Then on top of that, they went fishing all night. Once again, leaving his own, his other son at this football game to get picked up by somebody else. Totally stood him up. And then when David and this foster child got home the next morning, uh, his wife, who was the guest for the episode, her name is Carla. Um, David said, you know, when she confronted him about all of this, he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. You're just, and you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. Just acted like it never happened. And then they went to a church function. He was uh, obnoxious there. She had to bring him home. She went back to this uh, church function to get the rest of uh, her family. When she returned home, David was gone, never to be seen again. Um, now, what was discovered, though, after this disappearance, uh, what they discovered around the house is that David had had a drinking problem in the mid-1990s. They discovered that he was hiding alcohol bottles in the house. This was what discovered. So obviously he had had a relapse um, of drinking alcohol again, uh, being, a, being an alcoholic previously. And the belief is that that once again took over his life and maybe he felt guilty about it or whatever else. And that's the reason that he took off. So that's a perfect example 
another of the walk-off. David Schrader, that is a disappearance uh, that I covered earlier this year. But as you can see here, it is now over nine years old. Question, what is the toughest part about this kind of case? Almost anything is possible. Maybe somebody, some people might even look at David Schrader's case, and we, I think, Carla and I even talked about this. I even asked her, were you a suspect in your husband's disappearance? Why? Because she was the last person to see him. They were home alone. She goes, yeah, I was. So I don't personally believe that she murdered him, but I can see why some people might. And it's even, it would surely be different if it wasn't David Schrader, if it was Danielle Schrader and I had interviewed her husband, it would surely be different. I think a lot of people uh, would think that Danielle's uh, husband did do something to her, given the facts. But because the, the genders are flipped, we're less likely to think that. But that's a perfect example of how anything's possible. Could be like Devin Bond, a suicide. Could be somebody going off to start a new life. That does happen, although it's rare. Uh, could be somebody's psychological issues. Or it could be a really, really, really well-planned and covered-up murder. The walk-off. Next, it's, it's a murder, but so – uh, so what's it say here? Everybody knows what happened, but nobody can prove it, although the killer could be unknown. So we have two different types of uh, disappearances with, within one category. On one situation, it's obviously a murder, meaning, for example, the missing person's car is found, and there's blood all over the inside of it. There's no way that this missing person – and it's proven to be the missing person's – and there's no way this person could have survived losing that much blood. Obviously, something happened, but there's no body. In addition, there's no, there's no suspects at all. It's a, we know it's a murder, but on the other hand, there's reasons to believe it's a murder for other reasons, but there are no forensics and there's no body. So a prosecutor doesn't want to, uh, can't charge anybody. There are signs of violence. People aren't talking, manufactured evidence. I'll get into that in a moment. Suspe suspects goes, goes on to get caught committing a different violent act. Some of these examples, Susie Lyle, uh, first interview I ever did for the program over five years ago was her mother, Mary, who continues to be a, uh, a very, very close friend of mine. And she disappeared. Susie came home from her job at a mall, rode the bus back to her college campus, University of Albany in 1998. And all she had to do was walk from the bus stop to her dorm about 500 feet, not even a quarter mile. She goes missing somewhere in there. Now, to this day, her mother will be very vocal in saying that she believes that Susie's um, boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend, that's still unclear, caused her disappearance. So there's no reason to believe Susie ever would have walked off. There's no reason to believe that she was depressed or anything else. And plus, would add in, I didn't mention this in the first uh um, class. But in this one, shortly after her disappearance, the boyfriend's father was driving around saying that he was seeing Susie everywhere to the point he was saying it so much that the police put uh, state police of New York, put an undercover officer to follow this specific guy and see what he was doing. He was just making it all up. They were watching. And he, they were watching him on the phone saying, yeah, I'm watching. I can see Susie right now. There was nobody there. And that is another reason, of course, that Susie's mother, Mary, thinks that the boyfriend, maybe, and his father had something to do with Susie's disappearance. Robin Abrams. This one is particularly disgusting. She was a Will County Sheriff's uh, deputy in Will County, Illinois. And she unfortunately was dating a fellow officer who was married. And when she broke up with him, the, he and other officers started to harass her. She ended up filing a sexual harassment suit against them. And during the process of taking a discovery for this trial, she went missing. It was even to the point that her car was found um, in a, a parking lot of a department store or mall or something. And they even had witnesses saying that they saw a tow truck pull in and dump her car there. So she did not put her car there. There was proof that somebody else put her car there. This was um, over 30 years ago. I think this was 1989 or 1990. There was even proof that she was not the one who put her car there, but still, this is still a disappearance that is still unsolved. Her body has never been found. They've dug up um, uh, you know, all sorts of places in that county, uh, basements, et cetera. It's still unsolved. But it's clear... And I should also mention the tow truck company, 
that dropped her car off there uh, was run by the mob. In fact, I just revisited this disappearance last year. I covered it very early on in Unfound's existence, and then I revisited it because I, I got to interview a deputy who was in the sheriff's office at the time regarding all of this. And he certainly believes that his fellow officers are responsible for her disappearance. And then Jody Husentruth, this is a kind of a well-known one. There is actually a, a, a podcast devoted to this disappearance exclusively. It's called Find Jody. It's a really good – they do a nice job there. She was a reporter leaving her um, apartment at 4 in the morning. She gets out to her Mazda Miata and um, is attacked. And in fact, when people show up, her everything that she owned that she was carrying was strewn all over the parking lot. Certainly an attack, but once again, probably a murder, but her remains are not found. So it's a murder, but what are you going to do? Robin Abrams, it's a murder, but Susie Lau, it's probably a murder, but we just, you know, we just, you know, there's just not enough information um, to know. We, you know, in Jody's, we don't know. There's no idea who the, uh, although there's some suspicions, we don't know who did that. Probably has some good suspects here, some really good suspects here, but still it's a murder, but. What can be done about it? And the one that got cut off on the page is one in uh, Clearwater, Florida, Patty Action from about 1979. This is a situation where she was out with friends. She, they were at a hotel, hotel bar. She said she was going to go to the restroom, come back. She never returned. Friends or coworkers like, wonder what happened to Patty? They didn't know. Eventually, her car was found. Patty's car was found. Blood all over the inside of it. But her remains have still not been found, and that's over 40 years later. So once again, it's a murder, but. Best example, though, Dorian Myers. This is uh, January 10th, 2006, Vera Beach, Florida. Situation, she um, went to um, a poker tournament, like a, like a benefit charity type of event. She met a couple guys there who were who allegedly who were military veterans, and she was a big supporter of like um, Wounded Warrior Project nonprofits like that. And so she offered to bring them back; they could stay at her place while they were in town. This is a story, however, that comes from her ex boyfriend, so all of that is suspicious. However, what ended up happening that night is that somebody put her house on fire. It did not burn to the ground; only gutted it. Her car was found 80 miles away in central Florida. It was also torched, just the, the you know, the, everything, the tires, everything gone on it. In addition, with the house getting torched, it's obvious that somebody killed her pets on purpose. The pets had been put in a particular room. The door was locked so the, the pets could not get out. They died in that fire. So, and I interviewed her sister, Donna Jean Cap, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She died, um between the uh, just a few months after I interviewed her for that episode. But that is certainly a murder, but uh, it's still a big question as to who committed it. Once again, though, her remains have not been found. I personally believe that uh, her boyfriend created, this ex-boyfriend created that whole story. I think he made it totally up. I don't think these two guys exist because um, they put the, the – sketches of what these two guys might have looked like. Nobody's ever been able to, de- to identify them. On top of the fact, disappearances being caused by two people in tandem, although I didn't mention Tyler Norris, it's still fairly, fairly rare. And there are reasons to believe that this guy was trying to get back with Dory at the time. Uh, but if you listen to that, that episode, you can judge it for yourself. But that was surely a murder, but. How do people get away with it? Lots of reasons, as I've already stated. Uh, Prosecutors are afraid to go to trial without remains, without a body, to prove that the person's dead. The last thing a prosecutor wants is to show up for the first day of the trial saying that John Smith is dead, and John Smith walks in perfectly fine, nice and healthy. That's the last thing for anybody's credibility. You know what the prosecutor's credibility, you know, what would happen to that if that if that occurred. So that's that's surely a reason. Um, sometimes there's just nobody to charge. Just don't know where to go with it. It's obviously a murder. We have all this blood. We have this abandoned car. We have this, we have that, but we don't know who did it. So it's a murder, but lots of reasons. Now, a league of their own. These are, um, disappearances that just do not 
fit into any particular category. They're fairly rare and odd. Uh, people with no life issues, people seemingly minding their own business, people in places where it doesn't seem they should be should have been able to appear to disappear. The Marco Island Three. This was with three young men, uh, four men from Canada who went out into the Gulf of Mexico, and only one came back. And the guy that tells that story. I'm no scuba expert, but I've talked to some people who are into scuba and going out into the Gulf. They just said that his story makes no sense as to what happened to the other three. Uh, Jason Jolkowski, a uh, young man, 19 years old, no problems in his life, living at home, no addictions, no, you know, no suspicious you know, activity with him or anything else. All he was doing was walking from his house to a high school where his coworker was going to pick him up for work. It's about a quarter of a mile. Missing. Gone. That's a disappearance that's over 20 years old now. His mother uh, actually became an advocate, started the nonprofit Kelly, um, uh, the project Jason. Um, be because this business is really tough, she shut it down a couple years ago. Uh, but that is a disappearance that still confounds me. I do have my own personal suspicions about it, but it's just conjecture and, and theories. But a uh, nice young man goes missing right in a neighborhood at like 11 in the morning in Omaha, Nebraska. Ben Charles Padilla, he and at least one other person stole a Boeing 727 from uh, an airport in Angola uh, in Africa. That was in 2003. Neither he nor this other guy or the jet were ever seen again. Of course, a Boeing 727 is like a passenger jet missing. Another passenger jet that uh, disappearance that I covered on the program, Flight 370, I had Jeff Wise, who is the foremost expert on it. That, of course, we know is uh, very, very rare. And Craig Freer, uh, what was going on with him is he was telling his parents that he was going to work at a, sh uh, at a grocery store, and they'd figured out that he hadn't worked there for weeks, and instead he was going to see this girl while he her parents weren't home so they could do whatever. They caught him. They called him over there. They got him on the phone. He was supposed to walk home from this apartment to his house a couple miles. He allegedly left the apartment. At least that's what the girl said. They were the, the only two there. He was never seen again. Very unique. But the, probably the most unique one is Dale Kerstetter, September 12, 1987, from Bradford, Pennsylvania. That's up like in the central uh, north area of Pennsylvania, uh, what I would say in the middle of nowhere being that I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, he was a security guard that, who was allegedly taken hostage during a platinum heist. He worked at a, a plant for Dow Corning where they made glass. The kilns are lined with platinum, which is even more expensive than gold, more uh, valuable than gold. And there is video of him being held hostage while this person, seemingly working by himself, went into the kiln, one of these kilns, and cut a huge part of it out, I guess, sell on the black market. Dale was never seen again, even though he was the security guard there. My suspicion, no proof of this, my suspicion is that uh, Dale was in on it and he got uh, backstabbed by his partner. I think somebody came up with this plan and said, hey, I'll give you a piece of this. Just let me go in and do this. You can pretend that you're a hostage. Nobody will ever suspect anything. And then I'll give you half the proceeds when I sell it. I think he got double crossed. I, I just nothing else uh, pretty much makes sense to me at this point, and that's a disappearance. Thirty-four years old, um, and what I did discover, though, you, you never know what you're going to run into when you cover some of these disappearances. You learn a lot of, about other things you don't expect to learn about. Actually, platinum heists in the United States uh, were quite common in the 1970s and 1980s, much more than I could have ever imagined. So. The platinum being stolen maybe is not odd that he went missing during the heist of some is odd. None of the other security guards in any of these other heists uh, went missing. Question, does that mean they are unsolvable? Not necessarily. All of these disappearances, all of them, all of them, all 230 of them are solvable. There's just odds on percentages. Some very, very low. Some somewhat high, and I will tell you some of the disappearances that have, uh, I've covered have been solved. Uh, I've covered 230. I would say, unfortunately, though, it's like less than 20, so less than 10%. But you never know which ones those are going to be. You just never know. It's, uh, it's completely unpredictable, completely unpredictable.
So moving on, uh, the investigation problems. Once again, there are, the estimate is there's about 100,000 disappearances. Even if we were to maybe reject that number, just go by the number that's on NamUs, it's still 20-some thousand. It's quite a few. What are the investigation problems? Once again, these are the things that, that guests have told me. This is what uh, you know, law enforcement people who I know who are still on the job or retired have told me. And once again, I have no law enforcement experience, but this is what they tell me. First of all, there's no learning curve because they're so rare. Even though that number is huge, whether you want to accept the 20,000 number or the 100,000 number, in a country of 330 million people, that's not a very big number. But many police officers, investigators could serve their entire 30-year careers and never encounter a disappearance that's longer than a week old, that, that lasts longer than a week. So when you get these ones that go to a month or a year, you have no experience in those areas, it's tough to know what to do. And in fact, I've had guests tell me that some of their own investigators tell me, you know what, we just don't know what to do anymore. We, you know, we did the normal things. We checked this, we checked this, we checked this, we checked this, and none of that turned out, and now we just don't know what to do. I've been told that. In addition, you know, no, you know, no education, no experience. That's why I'm here, uh, you know, talking about this. And as I stated in the first class a couple times, but it's going to be the first time I think it comes up here, is you have all these classes about forensics, and science certainly helps. But what also can help is just maybe having a, a, a mind for this type of thing. And the only way you can develop that is by studying this stuff and knowing, you know, knowing something when you see it. Um, because science helps, absolutely convicts a lot of people. And even in disappearance cases, science eventually will help if you can find remains like Noah Davis is like just one bone identified it as his. That's his. He's not with us anymore. Uh, but you need more than that when it comes to disappearance cases. So there's no learning curve. Number two, minimal experience is worse than none. Uh, I just have too many stories of police officers showing up and trying to, uh, instead of just collecting the information and just saying, you know what, we're going to get right on this. We're going to see what do they try to be like a psychologist and that, you know, oh, you're, you know, your daughter's going to be back in a couple days. You know, I, it wasn't a case that I have covered yet. I don't know if I ever will, but maybe some of you have heard of uh, Jennifer Kessie. But it's well known that when she went missing 15 years ago in Orlando, that when her family showed up, they knew that she was missing fairly quickly. They show up at her apartment. Police officers finally show up. You know, they told her. Now, Jennifer Kessie was a, a, a young businesswoman. She went to college. I think she was in the process of getting her master's. She was working in real estate, all these, all these things. Police officers, when they showed up, they told her, oh, she probably ran off with some guy. She'll be back in a couple, couple days. She'll be back in a week. Then she doesn't. So uh, it, it just seems to me, and I understand the police, and I, I don't think that my program is pro-police or anti-police. I think I'm very realistic. They are put in very, very difficult positions. Very, very difficult. Um... But I think if I could speak for families, I think what I would say is just collect the information and, and try to do the, do the best you can. Don't try to predict things. And it's one of those situations. I think what happens is that so many investigators, they have these, these disappearances that end in a few days that they automatically think the next one's going to be the same thing, and then it isn't. I think that's part of the problem. So um, there you go. Once again, minimal experience is worse than none. Number three – the public is also to blame. You know, there's a lot of blame to go around uh, regarding investigation problems. The cry wolf syndrome. The problem we have is that a lot of parents, maybe they lose control of their teenage daughter. And they want that daughter to come home, but, but she's not listening. She's off with some guy that they don't want her to be with. They know exactly where she is. What do they do? Can't get her. They call the cops. They call the police. And they make up some story. Oh, yeah, he, he uh, kidnapped her. Oh, yeah, she's doing this, she's doing that. When really they know it's not a disappearance case, but they act like that. That happens. In addition, for the public uh, in general, no interest in disappearances except for their own entertainment. I do not treat disappearances as entertainment. I tr I'm trying to learn about them. I still have a long way to go. I'm trying to pass some of the knowledge that I've gotten so far to all of you. I'd like to think of Unfound as an educational program. 
Uh, I tried to, to – the guests surely have educated me. I tried to educate them. And what I, what I tried to do is learn about all these 230 disappearances and then apply all that knowledge to the next one I'm covering for the program. But too much – many people, it's just entertainment. The, the, you know, the, uh, the cases exist so people uh, can maybe get a TV show or they can sell ads and make money or they can make jokes and things like that. Public accepts that too much. This is serious business. In addition, people infusing so themselves into the process. What does that mean? Stereotypical story. Little girl goes missing, maybe kidnapped. A 7-Eleven clerk, clerk, and I can say this because I used to work at 7-Eleven at one, t- one time, over 20 years ago, uh, will say, oh, yeah, she was in here. She was with some guy, older guy, and when he turned his back, the little girl turned to me and said, help me, mouth to me, help me. And I called, the, I called the police. So police go f- flying down there, lights, si- sirens blaring, lights going off, everything else. They pull in, they go back, they look at the videotape, nothing. No little girl, no adult guy, nothing. There is nothing on the video. This is common. You know, I, you know granted, I don't cover many small children disappearances for a lot of different reasons. I stick to mainly adults. But I know this happens, and it happens in adult disappearances too, where people said, oh, yeah, I saw a video. You go to the video, nothing there. People just making stuff up. Why? They love the attention. In some perverted way, they think they're actually being helpful. Um, You know, a lot of different reasons. Of course, it's not something I would ever do, so it's hard for me to put myself in their shoes, but this happens a lot, you know, and this is why for me, when it comes to eyewitness accounts, I pretty much reject anything after the day of the disappearance because the human mind just doesn't work in a way where, you know, if you see a flyer of a missing person and then a month from now you're walking, you know, you're at Disney World and you run across somebody and you're automatically go, oh, that's that person I saw in that missing persons poster a month ago. Not possible. Not People are just not capable of doing that. I mean, a lot of us have problems remembering what we did last week. So I, I just reject any eyewitness accounts after the day – you know, the day of the disappearance, once again, unless you have video and, you know, there's a lot of other things to back it up. So the public infusing themselves just gets investigators off on their own t- tangents. So what can be done? Number one, education starts in this room. You know, talking about these disappearances, looking at the facts of them. What are people saying? Comparing this group to that group. Why, you know, why don't these people get prosecuted for... Uh, these disappearances, well, because there's no body, there's no this, there's no that. Education starts in this room because you're not going to get it out there. It's not. And you need skills to combat what you'll be expected to do by the more seasoned. You know, it's, it seems to me that, once again, this is what uh, families tell me, is that you just don't have a lot of people in it, you know, a lot, too many investigators Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Almost done. I would take questions. So uh, then I'll just move on to the next one. I want to get through these. Number two, every missing person is the same. White girl syndrome. We experienced it recently with Gabby Petito. Um, why she got more experience or more coverage than everybody else, even as a guy who's been doing this 24-7 for five years, I can't tell you. But you, you, there does seem to be a, a, a racial aspect to this, and I won't deny that. I know it within the cases that I've covered. I tried to cover a whole mixture. Whoever wants to talk, they're on the program. Uh, you know, I, I just take whoever wants to talk. But it does seem that certain demographics get more attention than others. And you know why they do? Because uh, our, our media is, is ratings driven. That's why. It's not driven by you know, everybody being the same. It's being driven by how many eyeballs we're going to get put on it. Uh, people who appear in police records get less attention. You know, if somebody, if it's a sex worker or a frequent run-in with the law, those people are going to get less attention. And police look for reasons to not investigate. I told you I was going to bring up Eric Alvarado again. Uh, Texas and Arkansas, they did the hot potato. I don't want it, you take it. I don't want it, you take it. Arkansas doesn't want to handle it. He's a Texas resident. You need to take it. But his car was in your state. You need to take it, Arkansas. Fight back and forth, back and forth. Common you know, when they're jurisdictional issues. And then number three, you must know it when you see it. 
That's why I go through these categories. Uh, whoever it is, whether it's a private investigator, uh, police officer, whoever, the family itself, they need to be able to look at the facts of what happened and be able to start putting in these disappearance, their disappearance in a category and know how to com- to to compare and contrast that one to any other ones that they know. That's going to help with uh, any investigation. The challenge, the person who will come back in three days could be exactly like the person who doesn't come back at all. At the beginning, they all look the same. And that was my October 12th, 2021 presentation to criminal justice students at Northwestern State University in Natchitoches, Louisiana. I thank Professor Michelle Holcomb for inviting me to speak there. It seems like yesterday. I hope to get back there soon. And if you're wondering, I did take questions from the students. However, the audio was very, very poor given how I was recording the presentation that day. You could hear me answer the questions, but you couldn't hear the students asking them. There are many points that I would like you to take away from what I said during that class. So please consider coming back to this episode once in a while to brush up on your disappearance knowledge. What are those points? I'll list them now. There are more than the usual three, but I will make sure I'm quick about this. Number one, yes, disappearances are a subject that can be learned just like math or history or a foreign language. In fact, I will go as far as to even say it's a science. Number two, disappearances have patterns and trends like anything else, meaning other disappearances, solved or unsolved, can be used to analyze the one that sits before you right at that moment. Number three, The concept of knowing it when you see it. There are different types of disappearances. Being able to quickly tell what kind it is, whether recent or not, is the key to being able to solve it. Before I get to point number four, I didn't get into how disappearances are actually solved in this presentation. However, that topic was part of all the others since then. Number four. Resolutions are usually straightforward. What this means is despite all the web sleuths and Reddit talk and the human desire to be creative, if you really want to solve a disappearance, find the simplest theory that fits the facts and history. Number five, relationships are the number one cause of disappearances. Not serial killers, not Israel Keys, not the smiley face killers. Instead, it's friendships, marriages, business arrangements, etc. that instigate most disappearances. And the last one, number six, disappearances can happen to anyone at any time. Yes, the choices people make can certainly affect the odds, but never think you are outside the window of disappearing. That ends the class for today. But if you'd like to get further insight on my thinking and theories for not just disappearances in general, but on specific ones, please sign up at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.